What's a normal weight for a peanut butter M&M? And how much do the weights differ within this container, this bowl of M&Ms that I have? Today we're going to look at frequency using M&Ms as an example, and then we're gonna go into Excel and create a frequency distribution table that explains the M&Ms or whatever other data we want to understand the frequency about. Hi, I'm Jen. To build a frequency distribution table and understand what the difference is in these weights, the first thing I need to do is collect data about my M&Ms. We're using this sharing size bag of M&Ms that has 159 M&Ms in it so that we have a good amount of data to look at and group into different segments. In an upcoming video, we'll talk about sample size and how that impacts the accuracy of the results that you get when you look at statistics, but for today, Today, let's assume that this is a good enough sample size to tell us something about all peanut butter M&Ms. I have gone ahead and weighed every M&M in this bowl and written down the weight. Here's what that looks like as a collection of data points. Let's start to make sense out of this data by looking at our highest and lowest values. On the low end, we have an M&M that only weighs 1.13 grams. And on the high end, we have one that weighs 2.53 grams. So that seems like a pretty big difference in weights. This one weighs more than twice what this other one weighs. This low point and high point represent our minimum and maximum values and together constitute our data range. Now we're going to start to group our M&Ms together in different classes or segments to understand a little bit more about this data. There are multiple different formulas within statistics that we can use to calculate our class size or our bin size. Every method has its pros and cons. In general, what we're trying to accomplish is we want to break up our data, in this case our M&M data points, into enough groups that we can see some distinct differences that tell us something about it. So if I were to just break this into two groups, it wouldn't tell me a lot because I would just have maybe what's below the midpoint and what's above the midpoint of the weight. However, if I break it into too many points, if I took these 159 points and said, I'm going to do them in bin sizes of two M&Ms a piece, that's gonna be so many segments that it's hard to get much information out of that either. Another consideration is to pick group sizes that make a little bit of sense or are easy to manipulate. So we know our data range is 1.13 grams to 2.53 grams. When I look at this information, my reaction is to divide this into segments of 0.2 grams a piece. I would start at a round number, so I'm going to start at 1.1 grams, and my first group will run from 1.1 to 1.29, and then my second group will start at 1.3 and run to 1.49, and so on. This is going to give us eight total classes. That's enough different classes or bins that we'll be able to see some clear differences from group to group, but not so many that the information becomes somewhat irrelevant. You could also approach from the other direction and decide how many bins you want and then decide what that means for your class sizes. So I could have started and said that I wanted, let's say, 10 different classes or bins, and then looked at what that meant in terms of weight to break it up to even amounts of weight in each group. It is very important that you maintain the same value of distance in each of your segments so that they cover the same amount of territory and you can see how the amount of data that fits into each class or bin differs from group to group. Let's start out by listing all of our bin sizes. I'll start with the lower limits. So we have our first class will start at 1.1, class two will start at 1.3, class three will start at 1.5, and so on. Now we're gonna take that upper limit and we're going to go to just below the start of the next class. So in the case of my M&Ms, my weights go out to two decimal places. So I'm going to set up my class sizes to represent that. I know that my second class starts at 1.3, or really 1.30, so I want my 
first class to end at 1.29. Go through and assign this value for every class that you have in your group. It's also common sometimes for the top end, instead of being uh, 2.5 to 2.69, to be 2.5 plus. So anything that's greater than that top range that you set will all be lumped together. That's your tail of data. Now we want to take each of these M&Ms and start putting them into the class or bin that they belong in. Once we've divided this data into different classes, we count up the total number in each class to get the frequency. Putting this all into our table that has our start and end values for our bins and our frequency amount give us a frequency distribution table. Now that we've seen the physical example, let's go to Excel and look at how to do these calculations and create this frequency distribution table within Excel. I've already entered the color and weight of all of the M&Ms into my spreadsheet. This is the same data that we looked at last week in the introduction to statistics. Let's start by finding the highest and lowest values in our data. To find the minimum, we use the formula equals min and then the values we want to include. These values can be comma separated or a range. In our case, we'll use the range of cell B2 through B160 because this is where all of our data points lie. To find the maximum, we'll use the formula equals max values to include. And again, these values can be comma separated or a range. We'll again use the cells B2 through B160 to find our maximum value. Now let's start creating our bins or classes. I'll start out by entering the labels and creating a column for lower limits and a column for upper limits. To calculate the upper limits, I'm adding 0.19 to the lower limits. You could type these in manually, but as you get more classes and to ensure accuracy, sometimes using a formula is the better way to go. Now we're going to use data analysis tools within Excel to get the frequency for each of our bins. Go to the Data tab and select Data Analysis. Note that you have to have the Analysis Tool Pack enabled in order to see this option. If you don't see this option in Excel, I've put instructions up on the screen on how to activate the Tool Pack. You can pause the video here while you go activate that Tool Pack. Once we've gone to the Data tab and selected the Data Analysis button, we'll get this pop-up where we have multiple different analysis options to choose from. This is something we'll come back to in the coming weeks. For now, we'll select the Histogram option in order to calculate frequency. We need to provide a few different pieces of information now. First, we need to provide the input range. This is all of our data points that we want to split out into our different groups or bins. In this case, we're using cells B2 through B160. Next, we'll add our bin range. We entered both lower and upper limits for our bins. To use this histogram function within Excel, we need to select only our upper limits on the bins. So I've selected cells H4 to H11. We also need to select where we want our results to show up. This automatically will show up on a different page, but I like to have it on the same tab because it makes it really easy to see what's happening in our data. I've selected J2 as the cell where our results should populate. You'll notice at the bottom there are several additional options that you can select from. Let's check the box for chart output so our data also shows up in a histogram chart form. Here's our results. I'm going to insert a column to add frequency next to my other class data. I'll paste the values from my bin and frequency table and then drop off the decimals in my resulting numbers. I'll also add a label to this table and clean it up a bit. This table that we've ended up with is our frequency distribution table. 
We can also look at the same data in a graphical view if we go over to our histogram. Thanks for watching. Next week, I'll be building on frequency distributions to talk about probability distributions.